Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Evolutionary Mysticism and a New Ecology. My name is Amy Edelstein, and I want to thank you all for joining me today. I am really thrilled that we're going to be speaking about this today, and these are insights and discoveries and questions that I've been thinking about uh, for the last probably decade and a half, but quite specifically over the last two years. And I want to share with you uh, my latest questions and my latest discoveries, and I hope to inspire in you a renewed sense of curiosity and to spark further shoots of your own exploration and inquiry into the vast and subtle uh, understanding of what an evolutionary spirituality and an evolutionary spiritual path might be. We're going to cover ideas uh, about the world in process, what process and a world that is moving means about our own relationship to the world, to ourselves, to each other, to the biosphere, and to spirit, to our sense of what that numinous mystery at the heart of life is, how it works, how we can be more lit up by it, how we can express it more in this world, and ways that, that we can really engage with our own um, love and passion and understanding of what uh, the human heart is all about. What I've been exploring afreshly is, is questioning what a truly non-dual relationship is to spirit and to matter. We live in a world that's material. We relate to material things. We think about our future and how, it's, how our future is going to look, how our environment is going to be, whether it's going to be healthy, whether it's going to be harmed, what we can, how we can care for human beings that we share this planet with better, how we're not caring for them enough. And then we have our relationship to that mystery that seems to be uh, prior to all of manifestation. Now it's easy to think about these two as separate, as two different things. And what I want to explore in this uh, teleseminar this morning is how to see them as one. And really, we're going to work with the insights uh, from Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, French Jesuit priest and paleontologist and beautiful, beautiful mystic and thinker who's ju who was just an extraordinary human being. And we're also going to work uh, with the insights from Alfred North Whitehead, who was also a beautiful mystic with a deeply spiritual heart, but we know him for his mathematical logic and for uh, laying out the bones of process philosophy. We don't think of him in the same religious sense that we may think of Teilhard, and I want to introduce you to that side of Alfred North Whitehead. He's, he's been, uh, the side of him has been a welcome and refreshing discovery for me and one that I think is touching, especially for anyone who works in a more mathematical or scientific context, to be able to see the heart and humility and wonder and great connection with the complexity of all life that, that comes out of his writings and his thinking. Part of the reason that I've been exploring this anew is about a year and a half ago, I was ordained as, I believe, the first interfaith minister specifically of evolutionary spirituality and the Order of Universalist Interfaith and their parent organization, the Council of Interfaith Churches, named me as their wisdom keeper of the path of evolutionary spirituality. Now, I have yet to uh, help encourage uh, dialogue and exploration and diversification of this, and that's partly what I want to do in this teleseminar today and to invite 
all of you who are thinking about these things to correspond with me and write to me and share with me what you're reading, what you're thinking, what you're writing, your discoveries, your insights, your intimations, so we can really help um, populate this beautiful path with different thinking and, and diverse uh, avenues of exploration. And of course, my introduction to evolutionary spirituality came from my work at Enlightened Next and, and the, the deep uh, research that we did for Enlightened Next, what is Enlightenment Magazine, and of course the, the collective engagement and communication that was part of the workings of what uh, Teilhard de Chardin might have been pointing to. So my main interest right now is, not, is, is to help share some of the different ideas, some of the different thinkers, so we can really begin to see this path as one that has had a lot of tributaries to it and one that we are also contributing to in our own right and in our own way. And there really is so much more to explore so that we really become these, these individuals lit up by this sense of profound connectivity and love and care for our entire world, uh, for all the um, beings within it, you know, from the tiniest, you know, turquoise little insects, you know, up into the great mammals and, and beyond to, to the sense of the health of our atmosphere, the biosphere, and our connectivity of, of heart, what Tehar called the noosphere. And just as an introduction, uh, evolutionary mysticism is not uh, just new from the last 150 years. Um, if you want to go as far back at least as I found is Heraclitus. And now Heraclitus was a Greek pre-Socratic philosopher who was born in 535 BC and died in 475 BC, certainly a long, long time before Darwin or Teilhard or Whitehead or Hegel or anyone else you might attribute to the origi origins of evolutionary mysticism. And he said way back when, he said, all is in flux. And this sounds like a, a, a very simple statement, but if we want to sum up in a certain way the, the, um, the, the pithy seed of evolutionary mysticism, it is the sense of process, the sense that all is in flux, that we are not static beings moving as static entities in a world, but we as part and inseparable from this, this grand process and flow of life are in flux ourselves as the context that we're in is in flux. So I was excited when I stumbled across this because he didn't have the, the means of, of measurement that we had uh, back then. You can imagine it was rather uh, primitive although knowledge was certainly being pursued with a lot and logic with a great sense of, of sincerity then. And, and with this observing power, Heraclitus concluded that all is in flux. Probably you're, if you're anything like me, you, you had a sense of this, what Teilhard calls the great organicity of things. Now, my earliest memories of wrestling with the infinitude of all things, the fact that there is no beginning and no end and that we are somehow connected and yet that how we are connected is constantly moving and we can't pin it down and we can't find the beginning, we can't find the end, we can't uh, limit and concretize our world. This came to me when I was about four. Now, I'm not particularly unusual. Uh, what happened when I was four was that I, I had a father who's a particle physicist, 
and we used to spend summer times in the middle of Long Island at a science lab called Brookhaven National Lab where he worked. And he used to take my brother and I out for walks at night under the stars. There was a great uh, research telescope there also. And he would point to the sky and he would say, where do the stars end? And so I'd squint and look up at the at the big dome of stars above me, there weren't so many lights then, and you could see, you know, just simply thousands and thousands of specks in the sky. And I try to imagine the end. And of course, I couldn't see the end. And then, if I tried to picture an end, my father would say, Well, what happens after the end? And meanwhile, I'd be looking at the stars, I'd be trying to find the end, the meteors would be shooting across the sky. And <laughs> It sort of short-circuited my little four-year-old brain because I couldn't figure out the answer. And yet, in spite of my frustration, it seemed to make me feel closer to all things. I couldn't pin anything down. I couldn't find a concrete stop and start. And yet, contemplating this vast array of moving planets and moving stars and us spinning in the middle of that seemed to connect me somehow with a sense of all things and with a sense of happiness. Now that was an early memory which I certainly had no idea at the time would would take uh, would settle in me in the way it did and which would, would really take root in me. But it certainly did, and that uh, became for me, I think, one of the pivotal memories and inspirations that became my, my quest to really understand that joy that arises from deep connectivity, even though when we uh, recognize what we're connecting with, what we find is motion. Now for Teilhard, he, he also connected as a child. He, his, he remembers his early memories of climbing around the fields of southern France and looking for fossils. And he, he often describes it that he was really a combination of both his mother's influence and his father's influence. His, um, his mother uh, being the religious influence that inspired him eventually to ordain and become a priest, a Jesuit priest, and his father's influence, which was more scientific. And he, he as a child, he searched for fossils, he tracked down materials and minerals, and as a child, he describes looking for that which represented permanence and not being able to find it. He tells a lovely story of having found this big piece of iron, and for him that represented God or the infinite because it was solid and it couldn't be destroyed. And when he discovered and observed that iron could be dented and it could rust, he was devastated. And he writes about as a child, with a child's discovery, realizing that that lack of permanence, that sense of uh, transition and uncertainty and 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 change, and it was it was a deep moment for him, even you know as a child, that led him to look for a sense of permanency and a sense of reliability and depth in that which moves. His real evolutionary awakening. Uh, he describes his coming when he was studying theology uh, at Hastings. And, and he said, and this is a quote from him, he said, there gradually grew in me as a presence, much more than an abstract notion, the consciousness of a deep running ontological total current, which embraced the whole universe in which I moved. And this consciousness continued to grow until it filled the whole horizon of my inner being. As a college student, he was experiencing a type of awakening, 
a type of awakening to a sense of current and a sense of process. And, and I want to encourage everyone to, as much as you may have had this opening yourself, this sense of awakening, to, as we speak about it, to, to feel into it, to open up to it, to lean in and engage with it afresh, bring it to life, dust it off. And because this connection to the grand current of things can inspire in us um, the most extraordinary insights and capacities that we have no idea about. And that really is part of the whole um, discovery of process that both Teilhard and Whitehead will point to, which we'll, we'll get to a little later. Teilhard's uh, n intimations of, of current and process really uh, took shape in, in the most unlikely of circumstances. They were, um, he was a medic on the front lines of World War I and in that chaos, in the absolute face-to-face -face combat and horror of man struggling against man, man taking life, the injury, the agony, the sense of despair, the frailty of human passion. In the midst of all that, rather than seeing only the downside of human nature, only the devolution of man, what he intuited in an extraordinary way was, was what he described as a great complexity of all things. He saw a directionality and this directionality for him was one that was motivated by and inseparable from love. Somehow from, from this, this very intimate setting in the midst of, of human at, 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 its, at, at human's rawest, most raw, he was able to intuit a sense of grand complexity and of life moving and of a directionality towards that. And for him, that directionality had to do with spirit. It had to do with the greater and greater unification at a level of interiors, at a level of heart, at a level of of knowing and at a level of spirit. He said, he wrote about his experience, he said, undoubtedly it was during my wartime experience that made me aware of this still relatively rare faculty of perceiving without actually seeing the reality and organicity of large collectives. And it developed in me as an extra sense. And from then on, he really did have that sense of large collectives and large, not just those things that we can see and touch, but a sense of the movement of time. You know, he was a paleontologist, so he was spending, you know, decades uh, of doing research and in the field, actually digging up fossils and looking at time over millennia. You know, and, and his discovery of one of the oldest skulls, the Peking man, was, was one, a great scientific discovery, not just of that time, but of any time. So he worked in large scale time and large scale geography, but his sense, this extra sense of large collectivities was, was even vast, more vast than that. And it included the past and the future it included our immediate surroundings and the cosmos way beyond us. And it included it in a very intimate and personal sense. For Teilhard, this sense of this connection with, with the large organicity of things was something that, that developed in him a transparency of heart. In, in letters from people who knew him, you know, written at the time, and, and, and those who uh, were, were his intimate friends in, in China and, and elsewhere where he spent long periods of time described him as an extraordinarily gentle human being, as one who had time 
for the most uh, gentle and delicate of connections between people. So this, this connection with a large organicity of things invoked and inspired in, in him a profound humanity. Now, how to bring matter and spirit together was something, although he intuited, it was something he spent the next 40 years working on in writing about. Uh, he died in, in 1955, and his discoveries, his, his writings in China, the, the early, his early evolutionary writings in the late 20s, um, catalyzed in him a desire to contemplate religion, to contemplate, he was a, he was a Christian, very dedicated um, and surrendered to his church. And yet he felt, and what he wrote was that there was a need for all religions to evolve, to move beyond their borders and to shed what is old. He said, and this is a quote, he said, in the future, the only religion possible is the religion which will teach them in the very first place to recognize, love, and serve with passion the universe of which we form a part. That is something which is partly why I'm so uh, interested in delving into the subtlety and beauty and heart of evolutionary spirituality. It's because we certainly are living in a time where it seems like racial tension and religious tensions between us ha have taken a new, you know, have become more exacerbated, have, have become more inflamed. The, the recent crises in, you know, and in, in violence in Paris, in the Middle East, in, in Africa, in the United States, the, the racism, the setting of religion against one another is something that seems to be uh, particularly inflamed right now, um, whether it's only that we're more aware of it or whether it is indeed more uh, inflamed as in, and our means of destru destruction are just more complex. It's, it's not within the scope of this call to explore that. But because of that, this sense of finding from the inside out, an in, in awakening in a heart that comes from this deep sensitivity to our interconnectedness, I think is, is, is profoundly relevant and needed. And it's something that we may walk uh, a number of different spiritual paths, but this awakening to an, to an understanding of this type of interconnection uh, can take many different forms, and and Teilhard certainly uh, encouraged that. He really felt that this um, the future of man lay in our ability to set aside that which has become old and divisive, and to lean forward into that which symbolizes greater unification, greater connectivity, greater empathy, greater compassion. You know, really, um, I think his speaking about that is, is a contemporary expression of what the Buddhists speak about when they talk about the bodhisattvas who, who exist for the upliftment and the sanctification of all beings. Now, I promised to tell you what he meant by the divine milieu, because we certainly hear that term often enough. And... I'm going to try to make that as simple as possible. Um, basically, what, what Teilhard, at least my understanding of it, and, and I really uh, feel that this, is, um, this was an important en engagement for me of, of leaning into what he meant by the divine milieu, because um, sometimes he's understood as a pantheist, that a nature mystic who, who sees spirit as nature, um, I don't believe he was. I do believe he was more a uh, panentheist, one who saw God in the world as movement, as process. Um, and so that we are living in a context that's sanctified, that's divinized, 
And yet that context in us are not separate. We're not like um, little rubber duckies floating in a bath of cosmic consciousness. We are both imbued with that sense of divinization and also held in a context, a divine milieu. And it's a subtle understanding and one that he really spent a lot of time writing about. Um, what he what he said, he, he, he describes it in a way by not describing it. And he said the mystical milieu is not a completed one in which beings, once they've succeeded in entering it, remain immobilized. It is a complex element made up of divinized created being. We cannot give it precisely the name of God. It is his kingdom, nor can we say that it is. It is in the process of becoming. That's one that's worthy of reflecting on. And I'll send you the quote afterwards because it's a beautiful expression describing that with what it is, what it is not, while leaving it open for us to continue to have an ongoing relationship with, a relationship with that which we are. Now, Alfred North Whitehead took a journey that was somewhat different. And he was, he came to this, this uh, um, wonder and, and love of the, of creativity, which is very similar creativity and process to what Teilhard was intuiting from uh, his work in mathematics. His father was a pastor, so he had some religious background, and he certainly had a strong moral and ethical background, and that motivated him. He was a good person, a kind person, and again, in the letters that people have written about him, about being with him, they describe his lightness of being and his politeness, his gentility, his lack of arrogance, his interest in everyone. Uh, his kindness. He was a deeply kind person. He was also a genius. He was he he worked on the three volume Principia Mathematica with Bertrand Russell. And they were at the time trying to work out comprehensive mathematical theorems to explain everything. And they were doing quite a good job of it. As he was working on that, he intuited something new and he intuited something different and he, he ultimately came to different conclusions about the nature of all things than Bertrand Russell did though they remained friends uh, for the rest of their lives they did differ uh, quite significantly philosophically now Whitehead as he was working on this equations to explain all started to see a unified order and that order changed not just the relationship between things but it changed the fundamental way we order reality so what he saw what he intuited was not a new way of putting object a together with object b of defining me in relationship with you what he saw was that it wasn't really a universe ordered by things in relationship with each other. The grand order, the grand unifier was movement, was process. Now this was, it wasn't entirely in a vacuum, although he was, he was a profoundly, profoundly original thinker. He lived through the, the collapse of Newtonian certainty. You know, when the theories of relativity that were starting to emerge were literally upending scientists. Um, it was turning the world, of the way we understood the world, upside down. And Whitehead felt this very personally, and he writes about it. Uh, for Whitehead, um, having understanding relativity is what tipped him into the notion of creativity or process. 
And the way he e explained it, you know, he had just such an open, free mind. And he said, and he was also very logical, he said, if we only have objects and subjects, then it's very hard for novelty to arise. Because you have two things, and what can arise is difference in the relationship between them. But since the new things do emerge in the world, he felt that everything needed to be in movement. And out of that movement and the constant movement of, of, and, and flux and process, then true creativity, that which is novel, has room to emerge. Now, he first used the word creativity in his book, Religion in the Making, in 1926. And when he used that word, believe it or not, in 1926, creativity was not in the English language. In 1929, when he published his, perhaps his most famous book, Process and Reality, he really began using the term as the best way to express the role of novelty within life. And his, his goal with that was to develop a way of speaking and thinking and intuiting that would describe the processes of evolution and energy and wave theory. Now, it's extraordinary because we use the term creativity in so many different ways. What Whitehead meant, he meant something very specific he said that creativity, and this is a quote, is without a character of its own. It is that ultimate notion of the highest generality at the base of actuality. So he said it's the highest generality at the base of actuality. He looked at actuality first and then intuited from actuality as he saw it, the highest generality. And his generality was that the universe is a creative advance into novelty, that we are moving in this creative advance into that which is new. Now, what that means for us today is it really means that, that there is movement, there's possibility, there's potential when we're thinking about our world, our global issues, when we're thinking about climate change, when we're thinking about a new ecology and a way to look at our future that is not simply a way of um, making good on the errors of the past, but a way that intuits a higher order of being, a higher order of relatedness, a more beautiful world. When all is in movement, in process, when that creative novelty is possible in the way that White had intuited, it means that there truly are solutions and forms that we literally cannot imagine. Now, because there's room for that which we cannot imagine, there's also room for deep optimism. It doesn't mean that we don't act. It doesn't mean that we don't uh, aspire. It doesn't mean that we don't lean in. It doesn't mean that we don't extend ourselves to help each other and to experience more delight and joy in life. But it means that there, there can come bubbling forth from process itself, from that flow and movement and flux potentials and possibilities and orders and ways of being that we cannot imagine yet. And that means that, that as, as grim as some things may look to us, and you can imagine for Whitehead, he, he, he lived through World War I and World War II, um, so did Teilhard. They saw um, horrors of humanity, but there was an optimism that, that went with their compassion. And it's that optimism where, which I feel is it, the spiritual path calls us to develop, to appreciate, to express our gratitude for. And it leaves room for a joy and delight. It leaves room for a sense of, of um, possibility and a sense of discovery a sense of awe and a sense of wonder. And, and it, it also gives us 
room to imagine ways that we may begin to connect, that we may begin to feel into this bright and beautiful membrane of the biosphere covering our earth and the noosphere that, that extends beyond that, that connects the knowing, the breathing in and breathing out of the universe. Now, both Whitehead and Teilhard actually um, expressed a, a logical way that they saw spirit in everything. He, they, they, they took their scientific minds and turned it inward to, because neither of them were nihilists, neither of them were, were materialists. Now, the way Tehard put it, he said, and he was very emphatic, he said there can be no doubt about it. What we call inorganic matter is certainly animate in its own way. Complete exteriority or total transience, like absolute multiplicity, is synonymous with nothingness. Atoms, electrons, elementary particles, no matter what they be, must possess the rudiments of imminence. In other words, they must have a spark of spirit. And similarly, Whitehead said, a thoroughgoing evolutionary philosophy is inconsistent with materialism. The aboriginal stuff or material from which a materialist philosophy starts is incapable of evolution. The material is itself the ultimate substance. Evolution on the materialist theory is reduced to the role of being another word for the description of the changes of the external relations between portions of matter. There's nothing to evolve because one set of external relations is as good as any other set of external relations. There can merely be change, purposeless and unprogressive. The doctrine thus cries out aloud for a conception of organism as fundamental to nature. Now, why is it important to us to understand what, how Teilhard and Whitehead saw spirit in all things? saw a conception of organism as fundamental to nature, as Whitehead put it. It really, um, as, as we feel into it, and it, in some ways it may be easy for us to get this with our minds, but to really feel into this sense that whatever caused quarks and mesons to cohere, protons and neutrons to kiss and become the nuclei of atoms. That force has, as uh, Teod said, the rudiments of imminence, the spark of spirit. It has some movement that creates direction towards coherence, creates direction towards connection. Now, this sense of connection towards direction is, is of course one of the the rudiments of evolutionary spirituality and there are scientific materialists who would uh, argue the opposite uh, it's not within the scope of this call to speak to those theories nor am i an expert at it where i'd like to come at this from is that sense that the movement that calls us to come together, that come and coming together ourselves with ourselves, with our deeper selves, that porousness, that intimacy with our interiors, with heart, with spirit, that connects us to nature, that connects us with each other, that connects us with music, with beautiful literature or poetry, with geometry and architecture, whatever it is that we, that ignites us and calls us to connect, this movement, and both Teilhard and Whitehead um, made much longer and detailed arguments uh, in favor of it, they see as inherent in all 
that there is. And because it's inherent in all that there is, it means that it can work in us in all kinds of ways. Where we see divides, where we see animosity, where we see our own limitation and um, uh, smallness and boundaries, we can see this force as the capacity and the possibility to develop and evolve, to come together, to reform in different ways with ourselves or with others, with nature, with, un with unexpected possibilities. And as we reform and come together, we're also united and connected with the same force and effort that is that has moved everything to unite and cohere and that's a profound oneness at the level of matter it's an extraordinary um, it's an extraordinary uh, journey there's one one other um, thing that white Alfred North White had said which I think is is beautiful because he he's he really applies his logical mind to this and he said God is in the world or nowhere creating continually in us and around us this creative principle is everywhere in animate and so-called inanimate matter in the ether water earth human hearts but this creation is a continuing process and the process itself is the actuality since no sooner do you arrive than you start on a fresh journey so this process this movement the sense that is within everything from the cloud, gas clouds before the world was formed to the human heart is still in process we have neither reached the end nor nor will we ever reach the end it's it's a it's a fascinating thing because it when we when we think about this more mystically and and less logically and scientifically we start to see the possibility for connections that our more logical and scientific minds might uh, reject. And when we want to intuit a new ecology, not just an ecology of environmentalism, but a new ecology of human relatedness, a new ecology of mind, and we want to connect with the sense of of process the great organicity of things we, I, I approach this and it's my bent as a more of a mystic than than a scientist is is through that sense of wonder and that sense of the extraordinary connection between things and the sense of uh, possibility and seeds that get planted at us in ways that we we don't know why as I was thinking about this new ecology and and um, reading more of Teilhard and reading some of the there are there is actually a whole field of, called the new ecology which I didn't know before I titled the seminar so um, excuse my ignorance for those of you who may be uh, well versed in that field um, there are books written called a new the new ecology so um, I can't speak to all of it but of course it's based on the notion of process but when I started to think about the new ecology I started to connect with different images that surprised me when I was a child we had a, a, a coffee table it was a small coffee table, probably about two feet by a foot and a half, made of black walnut that I used to play on. And the, 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 the table had a, had a life of its own. I felt in it this life of a tree. It was a tree and it was a table. And it was also, in some way, 
my playmate and my friend and I used to twist all over it and 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 try to turn myself underneath it and I love that table it wasn't a piece of furniture for me it, it had somehow a life and a soul to it and what I found out uh, as I got a little older was that it was made by a Japanese furniture maker named George Nakashima now Nakashima uh, uh, was was uh, a very humble furniture maker at the time when my mother discovered this table that she bought for about a hundred and fifty dollars and he if you live in New York you may have seen his beautiful altar of peace at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine or uh, some of his pieces in the Museum of Modern Art. Now Nakashima was a disciple of Sri Aurobindo. He actually spent time with him in person in the mid-1930s in India and received an Indian name from Sri Aurobindo and was profoundly influenced by Aurobindo's teachings on this fluidity and unity and this evolving consciousness and this oneness and consciousness in all. Now I didn't know about this connection until much later in my life and in fact my mother only recently told me you know some 45 plus years later that uh, before I was born she had read Aurobindo she had knew about him and she knew about him through this Japanese furniture maker who had spent time in India with this uh, Indian teacher. So somewhere, my love of this piece of wood and the spirit in it, what Nakashima calls the soul in the tree, expressed to me a sense of connectivity and a sense of respect and a sense of friendship that uh, entered my child's mind and influenced me, I think, in, in, in this subtlety uh, and non-differentiation between us and the natural world. The significance of this is, is as we awaken to a sense of the same process or current in all things, we start to develop a non-anthropocentric a non-anthropocentric ethic it means that we as human beings are not the measure of all things it means that everything has intrinsic value it means there's a hierarchy there's a hierarchy to life and yet there's a balance and a dance and a respect that the indigenous peoples and the shamans speak to with, with with tremendous feeling and that's a type of sensitivity which we want to awaken to as part of our spiritual um, growth as part of our growth and development we want to open ourselves to this felt sense of oneness so that the way we're seeing right now we usually look I'm looking out my window and I'm seeing the sunlight on the trees and the buildings and it's me and those buildings and the trees and the Sun now can there be a way of thinking where as human beings we are not the center the static object looking out at these different uh, objects across from us but can we feel into this sense of a felt connectivity to all things where we're intuiting in this vast sense where we are a part but what we're aware of is from the vastness we see our part now that to me is the path and uh, religion of this evolutionary spirituality it's it's not a specific principle or specific liturgy but it is that sense of being able to intuit and see and feel and respect and love where we are not um, blind to the grand connection of all things 
And that's something that it, it, as we open up to it, it, it really does create a sense of uh, joy and it, 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 it kind of dispels the postmodern angst and alienation and sense of lostness and isolation that we don't know how to connect, we don't know um, where we'll be, we can't find our tribe. This shift of perspective makes us feel a sense of kinship and congregation. We find our tribe then with everything. And I promise to tell you a little bit about where the first evolutionary liturgy uh, came about. Now, I want to say a little caveat for that because since I discovered Heraclides and uh, all being flux from uh, so many, you know, 2,600 years ago, 2,500 years ago, um, I may, uh, my reading is and research is not so vast yet, so I may yet discover something that will upend this. But, but uh, Théo de Chardin is the one that I know of who, who was the first to write about and practice an evolutionary liturgy, and he called this the Mass on the World which he began in 1918 and then completed his full mass in 1923, which he then practiced throughout his life. And what he felt was he felt the need to consecrate each day um, and honor and ritualize the gratitude for the process of the world to respond to the new creations and to lift up the deaths and transitions that are inevitable, an inevitable part of the flow of life. And this is something that, that I feel particularly strongly about because I feel that the, we as human beings crave ritual and need ritual and we can see in the early cave paintings from 23,000 years ago, um, some as old as 40,000 years ago, early burials, we see ritual from early on. We see ritual in the elephants march in their honor of the dead. There are, there's ritual that's, that's part of the fabric of the natural world. And as we lean into and feel into this newness of a process-oriented perspective, I believe that we can also begin to create and update a kind of ritual and practice that will bring our sense of gratitude for the beauty of life to the forefront. This is something that I'm specifically interested in and working on because I feel that our sense of congregation and community is, is part of the way that we share ideas, share new habits, and really amplify our joy at being alive. There's a real um, newness and directionality that can be expressed in the ways that we um, honor and, and love uh, the spirit and the ineffable and the numinous. So I've been looking towards, I, I personally don't have a Christian background, but, but in, in Teilhard's deeply felt sense of things, he was able to be, to express his love of, of a, a divinized world and the divine milieu that is not of this world, but beyond this world, in, in, in this um, mass on the world. And I think it's a powerful example, but one of many that we can create. And I feel very much that an evolutionary mysticism is what opens us up to this possibility. It's what allows us to be, to experience a sense of wonder and a sense of, of extraordinary possibility of openness and delight. And, and it's a sense that I, I feel each time as I lean into it anew, that in some way 
I become again that child looking at the dome of the starry sky and contemplating infinity and feeling both a sense of vastness and a sense of closeness that seems paradoxically to coexist. And I believe in that. We can really find ways to uh, connect and to develop and to be with one another that would truly be a, a, a worthy and, and developed expression of our humanity. So I want to thank you for your attention and for listening. I hope that this excited and moved you and that you'll approach your spiritual practice afresh and anew and that this will give you uh, plenty to work with and plenty to think about. And please do share with me your what you discover and those individuals and mystics that you're reading and that you're finding are moving you because the more we can diversify this field and we'll, we'll start to enable it to take form and to have different pathways, different pathways through different traditions. I have time for a few questions. Uh, if anyone has a question, you can press the one key and I will unmute your line and um, be happy to take your question. And I have Kinda on the line. Kinda, I'm going to unmute your line. Hi, Kinda. Hi, Amy. I'm calling from Salt Lake City, Utah. And I want to thank you for your time and effort and heart and thought and brain in putting together this hour. Um, I wanted to ask, in your experience, what do you find can be the obstacles for people understanding what you are talking about as you um, spread this ideas, these messages? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, the obstacles to understanding this in part tend to be poor communication on on the parts of those of us trying to communicate about an evolutionary view. Because when you begin to see the world as process, it's very hard to go back to not seeing it that way. And it becomes um, almost second nature when you have this sense of, oh, but of course, but of course it's moving, but of course it's the same spirit animating all. And then it becomes very hard to connect with and communicate about this to individuals who don't see the world that way. Right. To find the words to remember what it's like not to know that. Mm -hmm. And to find very human ways to connect and to share something that out of that, almost an experience of this emerges. We tend to want to lead right. with our explanations, and, and that, that's not always the best way. Right. Right. So when, when one is speaking about it or, or maybe even doing something that is an example of it, you're modeling it by feeling it and being in it yourself as a form of communication. Mm-hmm. And you're finding that no, that, that with, with, within you and within the other that is identical. And somehow you're doing something to get... Because since we are all process, we, we, we all are, are moving. And so there's a way of doing or being together where our own experience and our outlook is, is of that profound sense of sameness prior to mm. the difference. Right. Wow. So, yeah, <laughs> mm. you have to be so really deep 
deeply steeped in it that mm -hmm. you can communicate from that place and almost like entrain the other person without a lot not logical arguments so much as just yeah, really just coming from that place. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's wonderful. So with that, um, we are out of time, and I want to thank you all for taking the time on this Sunday and uh, getting on the call.